up, y'all? Welcome to another edition of the Star Child Junior Stuffs and Things podcast. And I'm covering up my banner. Check that out. Yeah. The Stuffs and Things podcast. You know where you're at. And on the other side, before he just went hiding on me, no, no. I, I have some of you may know this man. Some of you may not. For those of you who, who are watching me that are regulars that may not know who this man is, I'll explain it like this. I'm sure a lot of y'all know my own history as a, a child of, uh, of a parliament funkadelic. Uh, uh, I like to call myself a delic drop. <laughs> Grady Thomas made that famous from the parliaments. He call, I remember him calling us delic drops. So I'm a delic drop. drop. Okay. Yeah. And, and my right. dad is Gary Scheider. For those of you who don't know and those of you who do know, you know, okay, right? So uh, my dad, Gary Scheider, dope vocalist, dope guitarist from Parliament Funkadelic. But we also, know, we also know that Parliament Funkadelic was famous for having some dope voices, uh, one of which was probably the cream of the crop, a voice unlike any that you've ever heard. That was uh, Glenn Goins. And the two of them, Glenn and Gary, uh, along with folks like Mudbone Cooper and the Parliaments, Calvin and Fuzzy, you know, they're all dope. Grady. Yeah. But now Gary and, and this other cat, Glenn Goins, these guys were the two lead singing fools who sang their faces off unlike anybody you have ever heard. And there's still no one in, who, who can do what these guys done. Well, this guy next to me, that's Glenn Goins' son, Cassette Goins. I want y'all to welcome Cassette Goins to the Stuffs and Things podcast. Yeah. 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 Welcome, Cassette Goins. Thank you thank for you, joining me. That's today. a nice intro. So what you guys have is you have Gary Scheider's son over here, and you have Glenn Goins' son right there. And we decided to come on here and talk a little bit about our dads a little bit. We figured that you guys would enjoy that. So now, <laughs> with that being said, you know that my show is kind of a free-flowing format. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You prepared me for that. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so with that said, uh, you go ahead and kick it off, man. Talk about your, let's talk about your dad, Glenn Goins. First and foremost, for y'all who need a, a little refresher course, Glenn Goins, I think I've heard a mothership come in. Okay, <laughs> that's all I got to say. That's Glenn Goins right there. Talk about your dad, Glenn Goins, and what his impact in this band has meant for you and your life. Man, that's, Jesus, that's so much. Um, you I'm know, gonna light, I'm going to light my joint on it because I figured that was a deep one. <laughs> Well, the first thing, you know, when you talk about our dads is the first thing is you learn so much about playing field. That's like, right. what was it like to be teenagers in playing field when they were teenagers? Did everybody have a band? Was it just like house to house band battles is the way they make it seem? Right. Like, on. It, was you, like, yeah, you hear, it was like the breakdance battles. It was it, the battle of the bands and playing the battles field. of the band. They're battling in high school. They're battling it at clubs around town like everyone wasn't just a musician but then everybody's like these world greatest musicians what was in the water in, in this, playing field in this little tiny town in this little tiny town bernie gary my father billy like it's that, it's ridiculous that's one people that are, are not familiar with it don't realize about playing field new jersey it is a kind of a off beaten kind of a place you know, when you say something like Plainfield, New Jersey, mm -hmm. trust me, train, Plainfield, New Jersey is a little speck of a place in, within New Jersey. It's a little speck of a place within another place. You know what I mean? It, it yeah. is, I mean, you could walk across it in about 20, 30 minutes. I'm telling you, you know, Plainfield is tiny, but within this little tiny city, man, a hotbed of some of the dopest African-American musicians that you ever want to hear. And they all ended up kind of collecting in this one entity, man, that ended up just kind of blowing the world away all throughout the mid-70s, man. 
you couldn't have done it on purpose if you wanted to. And then when when then you start following, right? Any musician you hear this from playing field, and it don't stop there. That's right. We, we st- it don't stop. Like it, it keeps going. So that that was that's one thing that um I just learned about playing field because I moved away when I was younger, and then uh. My my grandfather, my grandmother telling me the story about how when they knew my father was a musician, because he was, uh, I guess he was like 14 and he was playing with a band called The Bags, which was another playing field band. And it's, it, it's almost like the whole town was fame. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like the whole town was fame. Mm-hmm. Like, well, when but, uh, so he's playing with The Bags and they have a, a show at a bar. Okay. And my mother and my grandmother and my, his grandfather super into the church, deacons, mother's board, all of that stuff. So he can't play secular music because he was playing in the church. Right. So now he goes to play with this band in the bar. My grandmother sends my grandfather to go get him. The way they tell the story, he got a, a whooping on stage and everything. Mm-hmm. That's probably pretty common in them days, man. My father said his, his dad was one disciplinarian, too. You know what I'm saying? So bring him home the first time. He sneaks out the window, goes back the second time. My grandfather goes and gets him the second time. Does it again, goes and gets him the third time. The fourth time, my grandmother goes, he's out, go get him. He's like, I'm not going to get that boy. He clearly <laughs> wants to do what he's doing. <laughs> and from that moment on, they let him uh, go off into the secular, secular music, which then... That's another interesting connection between us and uh, and our fathers is your dad is the it was the one that introduced it was like hey we need to go see about this guy this yes. is, he used to tell know, me so. he used to tell me the story he said uh, and and so what I do is um, I guess since so uh, the the one difference between me and you uh, your father passed away before you really got a chance to get to know him and you know really kind of get really acclimated to you know what it was that he contributed to Mm -hmm. and I was had a chance to be raised and you know submerged all up in it right but with that said my father he didn't really talk about this you know I mean so I kind of like learned about a lot of this stuff as a fan and what I do is I I, you know similar process there (laughs) yeah but what I do is I equate my knowledge of music business and then I kind of look at, you know, like where they are, where they were kind of, uh, you know, as far as where they were charting in certain mm-hmm. aspects and certain uh, okay. points okay. of time in the 70s. And yeah. this is what I what I come up with. Um, so my father became part of the band in 71 and really started writing around 72. And I, I think your father came into the band, I believe, 74 or 75. And I remember okay. my father telling me that uh, he told George, like, we need to go get this, get, get, he said, he, he calls him his, his cousin. He said, we need to go get my cousin in, in Plainfield, man. We need to go get my cousin. So this is what I'm equating it to. They were making dope records in 74, 75, you know, and they were coming, but nothing was charting. You're uh-huh. in the music business, you know what okay, I mean? You're in the music okay. business. You got record deals, major labels. You know, you got to you gotta come with hits, and they weren't mm-hmm. hitting. So I, 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 I gathered that it was time to try another formula. And when, when, when they brought Glenn to the table and heard his voice, you know what I'm saying? I could see George right now probably, you know, the light bulb going off in his head like, <laughs> ding! You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and, yeah. and and your father brought the hits. You know what I mean? He he brought the hits when he when they put his voice on the records. All it, it with that came it, the hits. It resonated. It, 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 it worked. It went it with worked. everything else. It worked. And I can and even doing that same process when I listened to records my father did without Parliament, mm-hmm. great stuff, mm-hmm. great stuff. But it's not like the Parliament stuff. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm but saying? that's but like, I will say though that Quasar shit is badass, man. And that's oh, the yeah. other. And that's the other thing that we need to touch on too. Is, okay. Okay. Uh, you know, hardcore fans understand that you know the family lineage lineage of Scheider and Goins mm-hmm. stretches well beyond just our dads. You disappearing on me? Come back, bro. My bad. Oh, good. So, uh, yeah, but uh, for the, there's a lot of just surface fans 
who don't really understand, you know, just the depth of of the lineage of shiders and goings, meaning uh, my dad, you know, has some has a bunch of dope brothers and his sister could sing her face off and they were all taught by my dad and brought up in the church just like your family you mm-hmm. know and and, and the goins yeah. also you yeah. know behind glenn was a a, a a army of bad motherfuckers and the the bags the bags had a song on the radio too yeah. at the time when your father called so they had a little song on the radio that was playing so he had already um he was already writing commercials. He did a Cheerios commercial. He did an army recruiting uh commercial that they were playing on the radio. So he was he was trying to get into the business side early. I get and I have to give that to your dad. Your dad had a business mind. You know, I like I, I it's clear. I could see that. Like I I've I, you know, your father was long gone before, you know, before I ever had a chance to even know who he was. I discovered him on video, you mm-hmm. know, and, you know, and, um, and, and but but knew immediately that that was special. You know, I can remember the first time seeing that mothership video and asking my dad, who is that? You know what I mean? Dad, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's Glenn right there. You know, <laughs> Glenn is gone, man. But, you know, Glenn, you know, and I, I, I can remember. But just uh, like I said, checking, reading stories, piecing it all together, you know, you can see that your dad had a, 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 an, a an astute uh, mu- mind for music business and an aspiration to be something on him on his own. You know, he aspired mm-hmm. to see, he aspired to uh, things bigger than and beyond Parliament Funkadelic, and actually went for it and had it, and, and had, had it, it. And, and had, had it. it. So so. With at what when Parliament was like, oh, geez, at their peak or at the beginning of the peak, it wasn't quite the peak, right? It's the beginning of the peak. Yeah. You know, they they had laid the foundation. Now there's nothing else to do to peak, which is the time would be a scary time to leave. Literally, the greatest show on earth. Yeah, but like, your dad already had aspirations of doing that, though. He, he did, had but still, of doing that. But that, still, it's hard to walk away from the Bulls in 95 yeah, but 94. But, but when you got the kind of passion that you're going to keep on running to the bar, no matter how many times you get your ass whooped on stage for going to play this music, you're going to keep on going yeah. until they say, I, you know what, I ain't chasing them no more. You know, yeah. when you got that kind of drive, you know, yeah. it, 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 with that, it, it takes a lot of confidence to have, you got to have confidence to be that driven. Trust me. So you do. And then I also think once he's, once he's with your dad and George and all you guys, I mean, you know, from all the stories when they're torn around and you see the old bills, the people that were opening up for them, right. The people that were opening up, (laughs) you know, so it was just ridiculous. So I think that, that added probably fuel to what he's going on. And, um, yeah, so Clive Davis, who is a monster, responsible for for so much. That's a whole let's thing. So Clive that's Davis that. is like, well, let's get a man two two deals. Something else people don't know, uh, Glenn yeah. Goins. So how about that? This is a lot of people are kind of hazy about how Glenn kind of faded away. Uh, mm-hmm. For those of you who are hazy on that, uh, we're getting into the the the, the crux of why. He 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 faded away. Um, so th- this is why I say your father had an astute mind for business. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I see it like this. Uh, again, before Glenn, before Glenn entered the band, Parliament was making some badass records, but his voice brought the hits. You know what I'm saying? His mm-hmm. voice is a hit. You know, hit with that, that, that bop gun. They exactly. Shoot them with the bop gun, on yeah, guard. <laughs> all of that, all of that. So you know, with that comes that kind of attention, right? Which is all he was looking for anyway. Which is all he was looking for anyway. So, <laughs> so what happened, you guys? Clive Davis, yes, the man responsible for Whitney Houston and all these divas that we know today, the Alicia Keys and Aaron on Smith. and on and on and on and on. Clive Davis gave Glenn Goins a record deal, and that's why 
he faded away from parliament because he went to go do his Quasar project with his, he had his own deal, you know? So. Uh, and also again, though, the, the format that George had already, you know, George was the first person to do that whole Wu-Tang clan thing mm-hmm. for our generation. You know, I got one group, but we gonna transform mm-hmm. into various entities. So I, I'm pretty sure like that was the first time, at least in our music, that uh, somebody was allowed to do that. So being right underneath that and seeing the formula, you had to want to go try it for yourself. Exactly, (laughs) exactly, exactly. And unfortunately, man, Glenn passed away before he was really able to put legs under it, man. But the record is we got quasar out. out Yeah, the record is is out there, and and a lot of you hardcore P funk fans. Uh, you guys know that Quasar record, but it's it's so, it's so funky. Oh, it's it very is very funky. Yes, it is. If you it's guys, very funky. if you guys have not ever heard that Quasar record, I suggest you go listen to it. Uh, this is Glenn on his own. This is Glenn on his own. You guys check it out, man. And I have Cassette Goins, Glenn Goins' son, on the show. So right now you have extensions of Gary Scheider and Glenn Goins right here on the Star Child the Junior Stuffs and Things podcast. And we're kicking it about our dads, man. Yeah. So, wait, so now we got to talk about your dad, though, and how how my dad leads me to your dad. So, so my, you know, my dad passes and my, my family moves to Georgia. And when I'm like old enough to start hanging back around again, I can hang around your dad. He's, of course, awesome, super nice. And so you start hearing all the stories and everybody's always talking about how my dad can sing and everything. And you're just so used to seeing Gary holding it down, right? Because mm. they were always there. So, you know, when we're little, all of that is so regular to us. You can't really see it for what it is. So I get a little space. You know, I'm seeing all the stuff about my dad. And then I go and watch the live 77 and 76 concerts, but I think it's the 77 one. And then watching your dad give what I refer to as the greatest rock and roll performance of all time when he performs Cosmic Slop. And I'm just like, they had all these people on stage at the same time? Yeah. You know, it leads in with the ridiculous solo from Mike or or, or the, the vocals from Fuzzy. Like just just another level. Then you get the solo from Mike, and then Gary steps in and does what he does, and and then just like having. And then when I f- f- found out that Bernie wrote the song, yeah. man, it's man. too much. Yeah, man. Um, all those shows, man, were just an experience that didn't stop, man, from start to finish, man. And I would have given anything to have been able to like experience one of those shows, man. One of those shows with, you know, Gary and Glenn, you know, and and right at the, at the beginning of the peak, I would have loved to been able to experience that. So now would there ever been a show where it would have been Gary (laughs) and it's like, and and that's the fun thing about parliament, right? You can, you got to go through the lineups like years of a professional sports team. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> would there ever have been a, a, a seventy-seven a season, the seventy-seven season, seventy-eight season? <laughs> would there ever have been a lineup where there would have been Gary, Bernie, Glenn, Bootsy all on stage together uh, in the same band? I, I don't think so. Like so, because Bootsy's rubber band, he would have already been doing that by yeah, time. Yeah, I, I don't think I, I'm not. I'm not familiar with this. I, I'm not familiar now. Not sure. But uh, like this would be something that it would be good to get George to talk about. But from what I can s- put together and what I see uh, and and from what I have kind of gathered and been told. So Bootsy, when he was even brought into the band, he him and my dad were brought in together. Him and my dad and I believe Boogie. And they were brought in. I think to, uh, to, for lack of better term, to kind of sit, be in the places of like Billy and Eddie, because Billy okay. and Eddie were kind of, I, I don't know if it was business or what it was, but I think they were kind of falling out with G or whatever it was. They were starting to grow. Whatever it was, it was kind of, you know, getting a little, a little shaky. 
And, you know, that's how Georgia's always been. You know, like, that's why Georgia's always, you know, when it, when the story's really told, that's why Georgia's had the collection of some of the greatest musicians in his band is because he put together something that was so dope yeah, and it became like FedEx, you know, it's like he, he knows it's a line of great musicians standing out there waiting to get the job of anybody who's on who's any on. given night. Yeah, on any given night. Exactly. So that's kind of how it, that and how how that's always ha- how that's happened. Um, so now that's kind of probably one of the first times that 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 G had to do that was with like Billy and Eddie. And so. Bootsy and Dad and, and I think Boogie were brought in to kind of replace that. And then I think what ended up happening was George kind of immediately decided that Bootsy needed to be his own entity. So if Bootsy did play with the band, it would have probably would have been like between the era of like 72 and maybe 74 or something like that. So okay. I don't think Bootsy had ever been like in the band when Glenn was in the band. Doesn't mean he wasn't on stage because I've seen those shows where they bring all the bands out on stage at the end. So I'm sure they've shared the stage, but I don't think they were ever in the band at the same time. Okay. That so and that brings me to another thought. Is everybody clear on how official P-Funk is because of the musicians? Like how official it is, like how you basically take the heart out of James Brown and just slide it over and drop it into like, you know what I mean? From Bootsy and Maceo, you want to. <laughs> well, so you know what, now you're getting into like the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing right now with this podcast. And, you know, one of the things that kind of drives me to do what I've been doing the last, you know, up to years or whatever. Um, like, see, this band being as though it's been so big and there's been so many different, you know, waves of, you know, great musicians at different times and time periods in this band. Um, and, and George being the main entity and, you know, having the period where he had to push himself as a solo artist, you know, he's always been the face of this. And, you know, as the as the years have gone on and the decades have gone on, you know, kind of the band members have kind of just, you know, like kind of blended into the fray. And, mm-hmm. you know, so like what I realize now is that you get a lot of, you know, what it gets down to is the P-Funk musicians are really probably the most unsung musicians in the game. Uh, What you get is, you know, a lot of people, you know, Bernie gets his love, Bootsy gets his love, George gets his love. And then once you break it down to the next tier and you start talking about the instrument, you know, the musicians, that's when it starts to get hazy and the the water starts to get a little murky. And it's not due to a lack of body of work, because when you start following their work, it's everywhere. Yeah, it's just it's more so just due to the fact that this band has never really promoted entities outside of George and Bootsy. And so many people at any given time have been in this band that people have just kind of got lost in it. So with that said, what I like to always try to point out is uh, like your dad truth be told is 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 you know he he's always going to be known in this because he brought the mothership down yeah you know it's hard to land the mothership and be forgotten about exactly <laughs> so but what i get is so i was on uh quest love has been doing some live p-funk streams he, he started on uh the week of george's birthday mm-hmm. and i've been on his live streams And I check out, uh, like, even him himself is not necessarily all that knowledgeable about who did what. Uh And uh, and you find I find myself correcting him certain times. But this is what you end up getting is, you know, since everybody's kind of blend in, blend into the like the George Bootsy and the band, you know, Mm -hmm. George Bootsy, Bernie and the band. What Mm -hmm. you have is uh, anytime somebody likes a guitar line, that's Eddie Hazel. You know, uh-huh. and, and any uh-huh. keyboard is going to all be Bernie. You know, uh-huh. if somebody uh-huh. sang and it was soulful as hell, that's Glenn Goins. Yeah, he wasn't He wasn't on the Atomic Dog record. No. Right, right, right. <laughs> and then it's like, and then George, you know what I'm saying? And then it's like, okay, some bass. That's Skeet, you know what I mean? Yeah, or Boogie, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, it's Skeet yeah, or Boogie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you know what I mean? And that's 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 what you get. All the drummers are either Tiki or Dennis. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Or Jerome Braley sometimes because they know of him from the mothership mm-hmm. show. You know, and, and that's what you get. You see what I'm saying? Like even Mike kind of sometimes gets lost in the sauce because a lot of his solos, like I said, people are like, you know, they hear any guitar solo. That's Eddie Hazel. Eddie yeah. Hazel. You know, and it could be Mike, it could be Gary, it could be Glenn. There's a lot of people that could solo you to death. So that's what I find myself doing and picking apart. You know, I, I like I actually will pick these things apart. You know, because I've actually asked and talked to you know either asked my dad or asked George and shit. You know what I'm saying? Or mm-hmm, heard him mm-hmm. talk about this shit, and it's like, man, mm-hmm. you know, y'all got to realize, you know, like like for instance. It was a guy on the on the the Quest Love live stream who uh, was like arguing with he wanted he was kind of picking a, a battle with me because he was an Eddie Hazel head. Okay. You know what I mean? And uh, and so Quest was playing the America East's Young record. Classic. And, yeah, but now I, I'm pre- I don't believe Eddie is on too many if any records uh, if, or any songs on that record. Mm-hmm. Uh, because that's that was the time around the time where they were with with Gary and Bootsy. Like that whole record is pretty much George and Bootsy and Dad and Bernie wrote that entire record mm-hmm. for the most part. You know what I mean? So um it was one of the songs was playing and my man was Eddie Hazel, Eddie Hazel. And I was just like, man, bro, I'm pretty sure I don't even really think Eddie was even that much involved <laughs> on this record, man. But you know you just scream out your favorite one yeah so all that to say it's kind of on us you know what i mean to kind of really tell the story and that's kind of what i'm kind of hell been on doing because for me you know like what w- one thing that really kind of bothers me a little bit is i seen this with my own eyes mm-hmm. my dad probably put in the most work of anybody who was ever in that band my dad is the one dude who from the time he joined that band at 16 years old mm-hmm. never left until he passed away 40, Couldn't make him. 40 Couldn't straight make years him. and with all of that in between all of that i'm not even just talking about his you know the con his contribution of longevity mm-hmm. you know like people don't even really realize how many vital contributions my dad has actually made to these records you know what i'm saying and for real like my yeah. father the unfortunate thing about my father is for a lot of casual gary scheider fans he can't get outside of oh he's the one who wore the diaper you that know is, that's, that's iconic it's, it's iconic right but you know what i mean like it, it, there's so much more depth to it than that you know what i'm saying you know or you know like the best i might get from him is man he held it down on stage you know which he did so that, that which was one thing i was going to get into was so after your dad left to take his deal after he you know laid that big old platform of calling down the ship you know shortly thereafter you know, my father had to step up into actually, you know, not just calling the ship down, but he actually had to step into a lead role. Uh, a lot of turnaround, because your dad wasn't the only one who left in that era. The parliaments left at that time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. J- yeah. Jerome Braley was on his way out at that time. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So, you know, th- there was a lot of overhaul right in the peak of when they were the most on in demand stage it's like probably. breaking up the bulls in 96 <laughs> yeah but like right in the middle of the season though it's like you know in the mean? middle of the season yeah. yeah 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 right so uh so with that said my dad had to assume a hell of a role on stage it became the you know essentially became it was the like a baton man. passing because you got my father with the mothership and then your father with atomic dog and like that takes it to the, that is the peak. That's why I said the beginning of the peak and then yeah. we go to the actual peak. Yeah, because the beginning of the Mothership era is the first time that they had stepped up and started doing shows in, you know, on that platform, arena mm-hmm. size shows. And you can even see it if you watch that Mothership show. If you watch that show, you can really see the only person on stage that's really like loose is George 
and your dad. They're the only ones who are really loose. Everyone else kind of like has this a little bit of a deer in headlights kind of look still. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, now yeah. by the time you get to 79, you know, like for instance, like my pops, that's one thing I noticed. Like for 76, that mothership show, I could see him step to the mic, like, you know, even talking right, like, how y'all doing? You know, he says, he says, he says, how y'all doing before he sings. And then he misses the first, he misses his intro. Too. Yes, I, I was wondering if I was the only person to notice no, that. No, no, and they I fixed it, it so smooth. No, they, they, just, just, they, just kept, they just kept rolling. Yeah, they just kept rolling. But he, yeah, he came in there. He's Tim. He's like, how y'all doing? And then he missed his intro. You know what I mean? So I, I can see it knowing my dad. I say he's fucking nervous as hell in front of this. And that, But it added shit. drama to it. You could feel that. Yes, it did. But now you fast forward to 79. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And now my father's on stage, man. And he's all of a sudden the coolest fucking front man you ever <laughs> want to see on stage. And he's fucking holding the entire stage down. He's got the crowd by, you know, he's got the crowd by the fucking puppet strings. He's making yeah, them yeah, touch yeah. their heads. He's making them fucking, you know, just all types of dope shit, you know. And that was just his stage contributions. You know, like, um, like, so what really got unsung for my dad, man, that really kind of bugs me a little bit. Like I mm -hmm. said, he, the, the contributions he made behind the scenes, like people don't even realize some of the best shit that they started liking about P-Funk, uh, especially in those pre those uh, post-mothership era. A lot mm -hmm. of the shit that they liked about P-Funk was a lot of shit that my dad was putting together. You know, like they don't realize how much he had to step into the producer's chair and how much of a yeah. you know a contribution that he started making from a production standpoint to that band, man. You know, yeah. like just amongst other things, you know. And then, uh, like I said, uh, uh, um, a lot of his 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 vocal features are lost. Like I heard somebody listening to uh, one of those songs the other day, and they said it was Calvin or somebody, and I'm just. You know, it was on the it was on the Questlove live stream too, and I was just sitting looking at my phone, just beating my head like, God damn, don't y'all know Gary Scheider's voice when y'all hear it, man? Hear it's it. un, it's unlike but it's so, anything. It's so else. emulated, like their vocals. Man, when I've met, um, so my father's <laughs> sister, my aunt, she had. Four, well, she got five boys now, but four of them were like an R&B group in the mm -hmm. 80s. Um, the family, they was from Plainfield, uh, you know, Tony, Keith, Poppy, and Corey. Uh -huh. So they got signed by Jam Master. I remember Master. them. Yeah, they got signed by Jam Master J. And so when they're signed and I'm hanging out with them, you just randomly meet producers and musicians and be like, oh, man, I wanted to be like your dad. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I wanted to be like them. I copied that. Uh, I think if, and I might, I think Raphael Sadiq has a tattoo of my father on his arm. I like, wouldn't be surprised. He's a hardcore, he loves, man. You know what? Everything that I'm doing right now mm -hmm. I, I, is, is all because motherfucker then met me and I said, yeah, I'm Gary's son. It's like, oh my God, man. Your dude, dad don't even, that's the best a whole... motherfucker that I've ever met ever in my life. And that's what I was going to say, too. Gary and Bernie were also like the ambassadors of the band. You know, yes. with George, you might not have been able to spend X amount of time with George or whatever. But Gary and Bernie would like they would have, they would have pull you in like, oh, you want to hang out with them. You wanted you, to be around them all the time. You know, that that's always my the, the best way that I explain my dad's role uh in the band of folks i say like george you know was like the, the the head the front man or the the star or whatever the case but you know like my dad was really like an extension he was like the accessible extension of the star yes you know yes. what i mean because you wouldn't be able to really necessarily get next to george but my father you know would kind of step in the way you know would step in your path of trying to get to him and say hey you know how he would be that dude. How you doing? Yeah, come on in. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Come on in. Hang with yeah. me. And so you, so inside of Parliament with all those musicians and and the and who did what, but then don't don't start trying to track the samples and the actual effect the total band has had on modern music, like everything that comes after, from hip hop to trip hop to electronica to 
the anything end. that comes after it. If you got the that end. move in your song that the, Bernie played, <laughs> the entire if you ever reversed a kick. It shaped, okay. it shaped the entire foundation of music of, 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 of modern all genres, music. all the genres that that preceded it. You know, what I'm saying all or pro no pre- preceded is before all yeah, the yeah. all the genres that came after it. You know, what I'm saying it. P funk shaped the the foundation of all modern music that came. There's after there's it. there's nothing that someone has done after that is not found somewhere in a parliament song. It's not rapping, it's not using vocal effects, it's not using machine sounding sounds like, there's there's nothing, there's nothing. You didn't sing harder, you didn't hit a higher note. You know that little, that, that little thing my father does with his throat, that, hey, that, uh-huh. that high pitch note, like, oh, uh, who did I bump into? I was in Atlanta and I bumped into Charlie Wilson. Oh yeah, because the Gap Band opened. And he's like, "Oh man!" The first thing he said to me, he's like, "That note, your father could hit that note." <laughs> so Charlie Wilson is a serious vocalist. Yeah, this is thirty years past the point. Yeah, and the first thing is that note. <laughs> that this, note. Your these favorite. Dudes, I'd say these 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 guys these guys are your favorite musicians. Favorite musician. Li- boom, boom. This is whoever you like. This is what they were studying. This is it. This is what got them going. This is this it, is this man. is the bar they don't even try to reach for. They just they love it way above their head. This is it right here, man. I, I'm telling you, I see it time and time again, man. And it just makes me proud. You know, what I mean, it makes me just want to keep on uh, as far as carrying this flag, man. You know, because this shit is managed to to to, to it's managed to to stay alive. You know. 40 years, you know, and more past, you know, when it, it came into the scene, you know what I mean? Like at this point, it's a franchise, you know, so we got to Rock and Roll Hall of point. Fame in 96. Yeah, the this shit got the Heritage Museum where the mothership is presently parked. So this Lifetime shit got to keep Grammy going, man. Achievement Award, we was out there. That's uh, right. was that last year in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we need some stars. That's now we right. just need some stars on Hollywood Boulevard. That would help. Don't you love all the little moments? Like you go to a movie and you hear a song or like I'm watching The Simpsons and I see, you know, they make a reference or you're shopping in a mall and you hear a song. And then that was happening. But then when those accolades started coming, like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, mm-hmm. you it made us look at it like, yo, <laughs> I mean, every day, you know, I can hear their voices, man, somewhere every day, you know, like, and it was always the craziest thing, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't even really know how to deal with that kind of shit in school because it felt weird, you know, because like, truth be told, like, especially by the time I was in high school, it was like, I knew it was, it was old, you know what I mean? But it was like, but this music, you know, I, I, you know, it was like, why do I just keep hearing this music just like everywhere? Yeah, yeah. Like everyone loves this fucking music. I can't believe this <laughs> shit, man. And it's like, no matter how much I try to just be like, you know, regular or just normal. It's like, cause we weren't rich, you know what I'm saying? Well, I'm living this right up the street from y'all going to school with y'all, man. I'm not making no big deal about this shit. And but yeah. I just could not, and I just could not understand why everybody would just be like, "Man, that's you know this, you know." Everyone introduces you to their friends, like, "Man, you know his dad, man, the P Funk, man, you know." Yeah. Like, man, stop. and you're like awkward. <laughs> yeah, like, stop doing that shit. I would tell my man, stop doing that shit, won't you? Was it was it for me? You know, because we're hip hop generation. So it actually helped me finally get a full appreciation was being into hip hop, then doing my own crate digging yep. and realizing like, wait a second, when you listen to everything else and then come back to this, this is the best shit going. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, because that's what was deep. It was like, you know, like we in high school, t- like 20 years after the fact. And, you know, like once I started like doing my crate digging and, and you know, it was like, you know, I, I didn't even even know some of the songs that I'm listening to were P-Funk songs. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, or dad would just like randomly say it. So he would say it so much that I would think he would just be like lying. You know what I mean? Like a song would come on, he'd be like, oh, that's 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 us. 
<laughs> and I'd be like, man, right, right. Every yeah. song is it. This, and I'll be thinking, I would be thinking to myself, like, man, stop saying that, man. That's not y'all, man. You think everything is you on the radio and shit. And then I would just, you know, eventually be then find, you know, dig through the crates and find the record, like, oh shit, this is the he was. I heard that they were the, the most sampled band in hip hop. Then I watched the James Brown movie. Yeah, it's between it's the, them two. It's the most sampled. So it's one of them. It is it's either James them Brown. Two. Either way, it might be the same rhythm section. Yeah, <laughs> that you sampling. Yeah, it's it, it's it's all a, it's all an ancestor of each other. So it's it's a direct connection. It's a yeah. di- I mean, like like where is where is because my grandfather is from Georgia. So James Brown, all of that, that's Georgia. Mm-hmm. So then what? They just moved to New Jersey. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They, then they take the, the Bootsy and Maceo, just move to New Jersey, and we all just form up again. It's, it's a direct, like, James Brown, it's, it's, it's a remix. Yeah. It's a remix. Well, it's, 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 a, it's evidence that this music doesn't die, man, that this music just lives on. This music yeah. is going to be around forever. So that's why I say I'm going to do my part to make sure that it lives on. And, you know, I'm going to also do my part to make sure that my dad's story told. So any place that I can correct someone and let them know, no, sir, Gary Scheider played that that's one. Right. No, sir, right. that's Gary Scheider singing that. You know, I make sure you, I you do that. Even up. if I got a ride for other folks, too, because like I said, man, e- e- y'all think, Every it's so many line. amazing y'all musicians. think every oh. guitar line is eddie hazel man like some of that shit is ron bukowski like how about, how about this? that ron bukowski played the solo on cosmic slot for those of y'all who didn't know that's not eddie hazel it's ron bukowski how about that you, you just you just heard a lot of people's feelings <laughs> yeah i know you know what i mean like i'm telling you man and like i said man no oh man I, I, yeah, I'm sorry, Quest. I love you, man. Your streams was dope. How about that? I'm gonna tell you, this shit was funny as shit. This is funny as shit. So I was on Quest stream. And Shout now, out to the stream. We all gonna look, listen to it. So now look, he had got to it got to the point where I had announced <clears throat> he was playing knee deep, and he was like, "I'm about to play the entire record, all 15 minutes." So the record was going. And, you know, like I was at my wits end with people like Eddie Hazel, Eddie Hazel, Eddie Hazel, uh, you know, just guessing or whatever, just throwing names out there. So uh, I said just before the song, you know, as the song, he just started going. I say, I say, now, anybody who does not know that this is Mike Hampton playing on this solo, please leave the stream right now. Right. <laughs> I, I put the LOL because I'm playing right. Uh-huh. Lo and behold, we get to the solo. And why does the DJ say, Eddie Hayes on the solo, y'all? <laughs> ah, and the Roots is another example because he knows that, hmm, was there ever a band led by a front man that rapped over really hard beats? Yes, there was. Mm-hmm. Yes, there was. It was Pete Funk. Well, I say this about Quest, you know, and and all DJs are like that, you know, the whole time he was on the stream, like what I give him, you know, he wasn't ne- like necessarily like arrogant about, I know, you know, mm-hmm. he, he was actually on there trying to gain knowledge. So, you know, if he was wrong, you know, and someone corrected him, he was like, oh, damn, my bad. I didn't even know. You know what I mean? It's like, thanks for that. You know, or George was on a lot of his live streams. So he would just ask George directly, hey, Unc, man, how, you know, who played on this? So who did what on that? You know, and George would just tell him right there, you know, but, but he was there. He was all all trying to gain all the knowledge he didn't have. So I give him that. That 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 was just funny though, because I had set it up, man, and he he, oh, <laughs> he wasn't man. paying attention to his own stream. Yeah, I had asked earlier about the uh, the aircraft footage, because that's major. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I, my father had a close friend who um I I spent a lot of time with after he passed, and he would tell me how back in the day, Kiss would be backstage watching Parliament. Yeah, because they were label mates. They were on Casablanca too soaking up the sauce as it were mm-hmm. you know um what was another one he told me oh he said one day and this is what i wanted to ask you if you ever heard this because I, I feel like i've heard this from a couple different people um he said one day he gets a call from my father and he's like you won't believe who i'm smoking with mm-hmm. 
And he's like, who? Who are you smoking with? He's like, Bob. Oh, he's Bob, like, Bob. Bob. <laughs> yeah. So he said they were in Texas and there was a show they were doing together and they all hung out. I was like, what? Yeah. George tell that story. George says, uh, George's story. George said, um, they, <laughs> Bob was trying to hand him his, his, his joint. And you know they they smoke that that seeded weed. They don't even take the seeds out of it and none of that shit. They just roll it all up and whatever. So George uh -huh. was like, nah, you know George was smoking some hippie weed. And he said, uh, he he said Bob called oh, a, a bourgeoisie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I heard um, that at one point, because you know when Bob left. Uh, the Whalers, and it just was Bob and, and the I threes. He had auditions for guitar players. My father auditioned. Oh yeah. And, uh, he auditioned. He passed afterwards, but the guitar player he did end up getting mm -hmm. is a guitar player from New Jersey. Because when Bob lived in the states, he lived in New Jersey working at I believe it was a Ford Auto Factory. He lived in Delaware. Oh, that was Delaware. Okay, mm -hmm. which does you know? Right there, he probably spent some time in Jersey too. But I know that the story is he lived in, he lived in. And Delaware. so I'm a I'm a I'm I'm kind of a Bob Stan, um, you know. And so when I'm doing my research, when you listen to the Bob Live stuff, uh -huh. it's like '79, uh, early '80s, mm. and you listen to what they were playing live before. I feel like you can tell that they was affected by Parliament's live show. Oh yeah. They was like, oh, okay, we gotta add some things. Like you can oh, yeah. you see this live show from 79 and oh, you compare, yeah. you can tell they added some some funky stuff. I mean, they were the top like live thing in 79, man. So I'm mm -hmm. sure a lot of people were trying to figure out how to do uh, how how to how to how to you know do something like that. You know, the top of the world then with, with what was it? It was it's gonna be Parliament, Stevie Wonder. Bob Marley and whatever Motown was doing. That's all yeah. that's going on. Yeah. That's all that's going on. And the Jackson Five. And the Jackson Five. Yeah, they were. Which was it, funky. 70s. The early Jackson Five. That's the thing about the 70s. When you look back at how funky everything was for a moment. That's what the industry does, though. The industry, you know what I mean? Like it's happening right now. That's why all these kids got auto tune and everybody sound like sounds kind of sounds the same right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's what's essentially what's going on every every, you know, decade of or whatever generation of, you know, music goers or music listeners. That's what's going on. Somebody kind of blazes a trail and then the industry jumps on it, you know. So and, and the funny thing is Parliament jumps so far ahead that even today when you're trying to be futuristic, all it does is remind us of something Parliament did mm -hmm. in the 70s. <laughs> and all they were doing was trying to find a, a, a lane and trying to find a niche. That's why you have so many different uh, genres of music from P-Funk before they found the, the, the niche with the, with, the, you know, with the pure funk thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, because that's all they were doing. They were trying everything. Let's try some acid rock. Let's try some doo wop. Let's try, you know, let's see what's. And in that, that approach was funky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were being funky all the way through. Well, what changed the game was once they focused solely on let's do, you know, like I said, where things were going. We're doing, they're doing funk now. You know, Bootsy showing him, look, this is how James do it. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Well, so George just slowed it down. Okay, let's. I can do that. Let's just who, slow it way the fuck back. Who was telling that story? I was listening to. It's one of the horn players, but it's not Maceo. It's another guy. Is it Fred Wesley. Is is there another one? It's not. It's the only one that's big, but not a James Brown. That's horn. Fred Wesley. Oh, that's Fred Wesley. Okay, so I was watching an uh, interview with him, and he was saying the first time he hung around the guys and they were playing and he said they were just rehearsing in a hotel room. He said, Jerome was playing on pillows. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, Gary and Glenn was on guitars. And then they were like, were like a kind of, I guess, a, in the hotel room rehearsal. And he mm -hmm. said, even then, them just playing in the hotel room with, with Jerome playing on pillows in the bed. He said, in that moment, he finally understood what on the one was, mm -hmm. what, what that timing was. He was like, they were able to demonstrate it with such they clarity slowed, they in that rehearsal. Down. 
because they slowed it down. James was always playing it like, one, two, three, 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 one, two, boom, two, three, three, three. and then finding them if they missed a little, you know, if they was just a little bit out of sync and shit, you know what I mean? So they was playing that shit under pressure. And George is so the opposite. George is loose as a motherfucker. Like George, George will give you time to, to figure it out during the shows. You know, he, he'll give you as many shows as you need to figure it out. <laughs> so, you know, so, that's so wait, totally, wait, and I don't that's jump totally down the, the opposite hole. of James' approach. I don't want to jump down the rabbit hole. but So you play with them now. You you in the middle of mm-hmm. ours, as it that's were. That's what I'm telling you. It's, it, I'm is, telling on you the one, is on the one a little before or a little after? Well, that's the difference in what makes it P-Funk and everybody else's funk. You know what I mean? Like I said, P-Funk has slowed the one down. You know, like, see, that's the the one thing that everybody that tries to emulate this that gets wrong. You know, they all, they want to do P-Funk. Don't say they, too much. They, Don't say too much. <laughs> they want to do P-Funk, but they want to do it at the speed of James Brown. You know what I'm saying? And uh-huh. Or the speed of, you know of disco or whatever was going on. Like everybody, everybody played funk kind of fast. You know what I mean? P-Funk yeah. is the only band that really played it, played slow and played on the one slow. If you compare the tempos, which is how you end up kind of falling be a little behind or maybe a little, ah, you know, cause okay. it's, it's harder to play. To me, it's harder to play on exactly on the one when the tempo is slow than it is when the tempo is a little faster. It's a little yeah, easier yeah. to stay in sync when it's faster. Okay, you know okay. what I mean? So, you know, just the tempo kind of will cause you to be a little maybe behind or a little forward. But that's the the nuance that makes P-Funk music what it is. All of that is the nuance yeah. that makes it what it is. Like that, if you were to learn how to play any of this music from any of the musicians, if they were still around, that's how they would show you, you know, they would stop you and say, no, you need to be a little bit behind it. You know what I mean? Almost right. off, you know, okay. and that kind of okay. shit. Yeah. Cause so. even, even with, even in my father's Quasar album, it's a different kind of funky. Mm-hmm. It's a different kind of funky. It's mm-hmm. not. It's that yeah. industry, it's, it's that industry standard funky is what it is. Like that it, was it, like, yeah. <laughs> that was like industry standard funky. Everybody very professional, because, very well done. Yeah, but, but it, the it point, didn't have as much pee on it. But the point was because they they wanted you to make music that would rock the party. You know what I'm saying? They want yeah. everybody to be dancing and doing that. And not that you can't dance at a P Funk show, you know what I'm saying? But you know, like oh, it's said, demanding. Joe, yeah, it's but demanding. exactly. As a matter of fact, it's easier to dance to that tempo, to the P Funk tempo, which is probably why it's fun. Even if you can't dance, you can move to that tempo, you know. But but you have and, a wide and, fan base, right? And then you have like George also has you know developed the habit in that time of not doing the industry standard shit. You know what I'm saying? He did what the fuck he you know he tried shit. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And that's why he was different, and that's why he was what he was. He tried shit. So one of the things he tried, let's do this shit slow. Everybody else doing it at this tempo. Let's pull this shit back just a little bit. Yeah, make it make it a little cooler, something that you can talk over, something I can DJ over, you know. After they, so in the '76 show, they land the mothership, right? The mm-hmm. mothership comes down, and then that next bass line is my favorite bass line, and and I I, be, I try not to be biased, like you know what I'm saying, but uh, that we love you, Doctor Funkenstein. Yeah, I think that's the most. I think it's the most brilliant uh, transition. In, in any kind of show, <laughs> I think it's the most brilliant <laughs> shit. Like I, I, people underestimate the dynamic of the whole thing, and I see it because I'm an artist and I see look at shit like this, right? But for me, the coolest, the best part of that, you know, like the 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 best reason why that works, and I don't understand why they didn't stick to that for a minute or never ever went back to it. But it's yeah. the baddest shit. The coolest thing is for when you know when Glenn has such a, a climax going on with, you know, with bringing the ship down, the ship comes out of nowhere. You know I mean? I can imagine mm-hmm. the shock and awe from the audience. Seeing Cause that, that didn't happen before that. Right. That didn't happen. The ship comes that. down and George emerges from it, you know, out of all of this smoke and it, and you know, it goes from that climax to this dead silence mm-hmm. and this nigga mm-hmm. emerging from the ship out of all of this smoke. And he just stands and he just, 
and he just stands and just with, with the cane with the coolest pimpish look. You know what I'm saying? And then you know what I mean for the shot, shot, shot. And the way he pimps off the fucking stairs, man, and he slapped somebody five on his way down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, <laughs> it, his is, wig. it is the coolest fucking introduction to a character, man. It is the best transition. It's, it, it, it's, it's legendary. Like, it's the best fucking stage transition. The, the ba- it's, it, it, it might be the funkiest piece of funk. Like, like you, you, we'd be here all day trying to be like, well, okay, well, what's funkier than that then? Right. Like, even, like I say, even all the music aside, just the whole dynamic of how it's all played out. You know, like, yeah. like people, like George is so, is a brilliant showman. Mastermind. He's a brilliant showman, man. He's a brilliant showman. And he was like in his most brilliant peak at this moment. And, you know, yeah. like I said, this, these are all the things that I'm keyed into watching this. It's even deeper than the music for me, man. Like just the whole setup of how it was put together. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It, it's just fucking brilliance, man. It's you know, we been, we been the hip hop generation, right? You know, the instruments were always in our house, but here come the drum machines and we're, mm-hmm. we're trying to loop and do to do. So then when you go back to your instrument mm-hmm. and you listen to them live mm-hmm. and you hear those seamless transitions that those just from moment to moment, just bang. Like, what just did we just it all go to a new song at the, the level they were operating on? It, it's that's that's why they're in the hall of fame that's yeah, why i think they rehearsed these songs are the greatest songs ever like it's ridiculous i think they spent like a month or a month and a half rehearsing that show man and it was it was so tight that we love to yeah why doesn't he perform that song all the time like he's just know. spitting bars I it's it's, it's one of our best bass lines <laughs> and he's spitting bars yeah. p-funk versus everybody <laughs> I'm telling you, man, it's the greatest entity, man. You watch ESPN, right? Yeah. You know, Bomani Jones, I follow him on Twitter. He's also a hardcore P-Funk fan. He calls it the greatest, uh, he calls it the gr- the greatest uh, American band of all time. And they got the work to back it up. And when he says, take it to the stage, like when, you know, because so, so I'm little, you remember when House Party comes out, right? And he's mm-hmm. in House Party. And he's like, take it to the stage. And they're like, oh, shit. he meant that. Mm-hmm. He meant whoever you are, mm-hmm. wherever you are, mm-hmm. come see us on the stage. That's right. That's right. That was his, <laughs> that was his, uh, you know what? Quest covered that too on his live stream. That was his, you know, that was the, the original beef back in the day, man. That was the original beef. The original battle, so the original battle rap back then. Yeah. Now he could say that with confidence, it, you know, when I look at it, because who was the baddest before you, JB? But you, but you know JBs, what? And who and who did you have behind you? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But so, you know what was? It's really kind of a bold statement because they hadn't even really hit just really just yet. You know what I'm saying? They were kind of known. They were kind of becoming an a entity. But they hadn't really hit just yet. Yeah, but but they were at their rehearsals. Yeah, well, you know, they, <laughs> they, they were they at were their coming. rehearsals. He knew they, they knew they were coming. I saw a critic who uh, talked about that that "Let's Take It to the Stage" album and 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 talked about how like that was the record that you knew that P Funk was coming. You know, what I'm saying at that yeah. point you knew. You know, what I mean, yeah. they, they, you know, yeah. you, you knew they were coming. <laughs> so, yeah. man, so. With that said, man, that is it for me today, man. I'm 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 over my time. This was a lot of fun. You got you know, a lot of editing to do now. <laughs> oh yeah, man. But you know what? That part's cool. I get to insert little cool, uh, little cool, little trinkets and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm gonna put something right there, <laughs> amusing, just you know, for shits and giggles. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Yeah, but uh, you know, you feel free to come on any other time, and we can do this again. I'm sure the people would love this. You know, I mean, I still think we need story. to we need to watch that show together live, like like and like it's like we replay a sports event. Yeah, <laughs> I'm working on it. that. I'm working on that, man. I, I'm 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 just now waiting on another little piece of equipment that hopefully I will be able to do some live. You know, bring I'll be able to do some live guests. I, I keep doing these pre-recorded interviews because I haven't figured out how to insert live interviews yet. 
And I tried it with Flea and I made myself look bad because he was on there, but nobody could hear him except for me. So uh, so we'll get it together then. Yeah, but I'm working on it. We'll figure it out. I'm going I'm to get it together. But uh, we'll get you on again, man. Most definitely. It was cool to kick it with you. Um, oh, it was a pleasure, sir. Yes, indeed, man. You know, you got anything that you want to shout? You know, any websites or anything that you want the people to check out? Let them know. Oh, no. You know, we just want everybody to keep listening to the funk. Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you listen to your music, just keep the funk in rotation. Support the funk wherever you find it. All right. Well, that's what it is. I'll tell you what. I, well, and you can get some of my music, too, because I yeah, got yeah. my own music. Regurgitated Youth, Hand Me Down Diapers, the, all of that. The Funkstar.com. Go get you one of these. You can Don't get one you want to be too. like me? That's right, man. That's right. Man, yeah. that's right. The funk never dies. That's the point, man. We keep the funk going on because the funk will live on forever, man. Funk is still good music, man. Fun with a K all day, just like it says right there. Ah. All right. <laughs> all right, man. All right, man. Take it easy. Cassette goings on the Star Child Junior Stuffs and Things podcast, y'all. <laughs>